Do you ever wonder what was there before Dodger Stadium? Or how hard shell tacos are actually pretty Mexican? Or how about the horrible history behind international adoption in Guatemala? Join us, Carmen and Christina, as we talk about Latin American history, sometimes involving stories about capitalism, corruption, and racism. Sometimes all three, but more importantly, stories about resistance, power, and community. Listen to Historias Unknown, new episodes every Thursday, available in your favorite podcast app and at historiasunknown.com. We are, we are, we are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stangle. Hello. Well, hello there. How's it going? It is okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's been a week. It's been a heck of a month, right? This is true. (laughs) 2023. You're a Lindsay. You're really just like kicking me in the dick like it's just (laughs) your Lindsay started out too strong so let's mellow it out man can we too much tea at the beginning of 2023 (laughs) can we just do lo-fi or smooth jazz into February can we ease more estrogen into that (laughs) dial back the testosterone a little bit have some T is in (laughs) T-E-A yeah not T is in testosterone (laughs) chamomile tea yeah let's yeah. just call let's just all calm down let's just <laughs> let's just take a breath huh? take a breather just a big old inhale big, big old, old exhale exhale namaste <laughs> so before we start this week's episode it is a new month so we want to take this opportunity to thank our patrons jenna Jennifer, and tom hey. thank you so much for supporting the show and you. you can join them over at patreon.com slash yield crime podcast to get early ad free content. And if you sign up at the second tier, you get extra bonus content like early access to our Can You Crack the Cramp Board episodes and some guest episodes that we've starred on that I randomly sprinkle in there for funsies. Yay! And we're going to be doing something a little bit different this month than we have in the past. Okay. Typically, the first two weeks of February, we dedicate the episodes to our parents. So like mm-hmm. to our mom the first week, our dad the second week. But I decided this year that we won't honor our parents. We're not <laughs> going to. Kick rocks. <laughs> we can do it in June for their anniversary. But this month, we're going to be covering important individuals affected by slavery for Black History Month. All right. Well, as a as a quick quip before we get into crimey stuff, happy birthday, Mom. Her birthday is this Thursday. Yes. Her birthday is the day after this comes out. So happy birthday, Mom. Yeah. Happy Groundhog Day birthday, Mom. I love you. I love you, too. And I hope you like this, even though it's... And it's going to get dark. <laughs> even though it's technically not dedicated to you, but I still hope you enjoy it. Because yep. it's ber- your birthday. It's your birthday. So this week, we are going to be discussing Gabriel Prosser. Oh, that's a nice name. Mm -hmm. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2021 All That's Interesting article by Morgan Dunn. 2021 Encyclopedia Virginia article by Michael L. Nichols. A 2019 Thought Co. article by Femi Lewis. 2018 Encyclopedia article. 2007 Black Past article by Wilson Edward Reed the AAREG website, so that's for the African American Registry, Britannica, the Library of Virginia, PBS's Africans in America article, ushistory.org article, and Wikipedia. Nice. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. 
we're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes, or over on our link tree to get started today. Gabriel Prosser was born the third of three sons on Thomas Prosser's Brookfield Tobacco Plantation near Richmond, Virginia in 1776. Hey, he was born the same day America was born. Happy birthday, America and Gabriel. Yep. Sorry, sorry you were born like that when everybody celebrating freedom and... You're born enslaved? Yeah. You're yeah. not. Sorry, Gabriel. Sorry, Gabriel. The midwife who helped to deliver him told his parents that he was destined for greatness, and as a result, they named him after the archangel Gabriel, who heralded the second coming in the Bible. His brothers, whose years of birth I am unsure of, were named Martin and Solomon, and Gabriel, along with the rest of his family, were deeply religious. Sounds like it. Unlike 95% of Virginia's enslaved population, Gabriel was taught how to read. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Nice. This act wouldn't be made illegal in Virginia until 1831, but it was still considered to be taboo amongst the white population of Virginia, as the ability to read granted the enslaved access to information that could aid them in escaping from their bonds of servitude. Oh, we don't want that. No. Heaven forbid. In 1778... Governor James Monroe approved a law banning the importation of slaves from Africa and the West Indies and instituted a law that allowed private manumissions were released from slavery in 1782. Hmm. So, like, we're starting to see at the beginning of this story that they're loosening up a little bit on slavery. Mm -hmm. They're starting to kind of give them the option to purchase their freedom or be set free Mm -hmm. that's gonna change (laughs) yeah no i know (laughs) we know it changes but like (laughs) but we're starting off a little okay so the pendulum did swing the other way briefly briefly yes or attempted to before just really violently just like just like minor movements towards good stuff until it was violently (laughs) thrown in the other direction fortunately for gabriel it helped that he also lived on a plantation run by thomas prosser who had a reputation amongst the slave owners of the area as being lax with his discipline (sighs) so he didn't like brutally beat his slaves yeah wow how lax he didn't beat people that's pretty great Pretty, pretty sure that's just uh humane but yeah I can see the other slave owners being persnickety about it. Yeah. You're making me look bad. Good, because you should look bad. <laughs> the bar was pretty low. We'll just say that. <laughs> right. When Gabriel was 10, he, along with his brother Solomon, were trained to be carpenters and blacksmiths following in nice. their father's footsteps. Being trained in a trade, unlike those who worked the fields, gave Gabriel a greater sense of limited independence as he was often Mm -hmm. hired out to neighboring towns and plantations. Like I mentioned, Thomas was pretty lax in his discipline, but when he passed away in 1798, when Gabriel was 22 years old, his son Thomas Henry took over the plantation and, quote, behaved with great barbarity to his slaves, end quote. Great. Thomas Jr. had ambitious plans for the plantation in an effort to gain wealth and prestige, and part of how he planned to do this was by hiring out his skilled slaves at auction. Awesome. So basically being like, hey, cool, I have this slave that is great at at smithing. What do you want to pay me to have him work for you? Yep. Overtime, because he still has to work and do whatever I need for my farm. Exactly. But you're buying the time that he would have. Yep. Awesome. Gabriel was a hot commodity. And as a result, he spent much of the year working at Richmond's various forges and foundries and was even able to hire himself out to masters in and around Richmond. Okay. 
And the reason people were so eager to hire hired out slaves is because they could pay them way less than they would pay a white person to do that job. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. And then, you know, to I bet you the the white blacksmiths were super bitter about it cuz mm-hmm. slaves were taking their jobs. Yep. Mhm. So it's just animosity all around. Yep. Great. However, the bulk of the wages that Gabriel earned while he worked went right into Thomas Jr.'s pocket. Mm-hmm. Gabriel worked hard to save all the money he earned in the hopes that he could one day purchase freedom for himself and his young wife, Nanny. I couldn't find out any information on, like, her at all. She was, yeah. That makes sense. And, like, when they got married, how much younger she was than him, nothing. Yeah. In fact, she was only mentioned in, like, three of the sources that I looked at. Wow. Regardless of the fact that Gabriel was earning money, he was by no means considered wealthy. For obvious reasons. Right. Many enslaved peoples had a practice of stealing pigs from their white farmer neighbors when the meager rations they were given left them in a state of near starvation. This practice was born out of desperation, although some committed the thefts as an act of defiance against their masters. I've never heard of this before. Yeah. In September of 1799, when Gabriel was 23... His brother Solomon and their mutual friend Jupiter stole a pig from their neighbor, Absalom Johnson, who was new to the area and an overseer in addition to being a farmer. Uh Uh-oh. Absalom caught all three in the process and scolded them to the point that Gabriel was incensed enough to attack Absalom. Gabriel bit off part of Absalom's left ear which was a punishable offense that ended up with the three men in court. Oh my God. Jupiter was found guilty of stealing the hog, which was a misdemeanor. Solomon was not charged. And Gabriel was originally due to be hanged. Yeah. Due to how valuable of an asset he was to Thomas Jr., instead of being hanged, his punishment would be to be, quote, burnt in the left hand by the jailer in open court, end quote. What? A.K.A. publicly branded. Holy. And he spent a month in jail. This was a loophole known as benefit of clergy. Gabriel was released back into Thomas Jr.'s custody after he paid a $1,000 bond for around $24,000 today. And promised the court 12 months of good behavior. So Thomas paid it. Because obviously Gabriel wouldn't have $24,000. Yep. Yep. Ooh, Thomas is not going to be nice after this. No. Oh, no. And Gabriel never kept the promise of good behavior. No. Because, like, what does he have to lose now? He knows he's going to go back to a literal hellscape. Between gaining the respect of various workers, black and white, Mm -hmm. while working at the forges, the theft of the wages he'd earned, not to mention the humiliation of his arrest, Gabriel had had enough and fully Mm -hmm. intended to gain his freedom. Yep. Thanks to his ability to read, Gabriel was able to learn through the various Richmond newspapers that not all was well amongst the whites. (laughs) War had broken out in Europe on the tales of the French Revolution, And this fact had caused a divide amongst white Americans. During John Adams' tenure as president, no diplomatic efforts had been made on the part of the United States, which led to Congress passing restrictions on speech, known as the Sedition Act of 1798. Mm -hmm. The passing of this act criminalized false and malicious statements about the federal government. (laughs) Nice. That would go over so well now. Oh, man. So good. (laughs) Twitter's the first thing to go. (laughs) (laughs) Twitter's just gone. And then Reddit. Yes. There was also an increase in the number of armed forces in the United States in preparation for war with the French. Fun. The divide came from the belief that the government had overstepped its powers, which would lead to another monarchical government under federalist control. So basically another monarchy. Yeah. I probably didn't say that right. A monarchy in federalist clothing. Yes. 
On the flip side, Federalists believe that the worst aspects of the French Revolution were the inspiration behind federal opposition on the part of the Republicans. Okay. Gabriel also learned about the 1791 slave rebellion in St. Dominique, which is now Haiti, where the enslaved population of the island overthrew their French masters to gain their independence, bringing to life the slogan of the French Revolution, quote, liberty, equality, fraternity, end quote. The rebellion, led by Toussaint Louvachour, also led to hundreds of white refugees and some of their slaves moving to Virginia in July of 1793 to escape the violence. Uh, Oh, yeah. So he's right in a pretty hot mixing pot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gabriel's quoted as saying, quote, we have as much right to fight for our liberty as any men, end quote. You do. In the later half of July of 1793, several African-American men were overheard discussing St. Dominique and what property they planned to take. Uh. Following this, a letter was found on the streets in Yorktown a few weeks later from a quote-unquote secret keeper from Richmond to his counterpart in Norfolk that contained references to men in Charleston, South Carolina, preparing for a rebellion with a stockpile of weapons. Mm-hmm. Following the discovery of this letter, authorities in Richmond, York, Norfolk, and Petersburg were made aware of the threat and prepared their local militias. With the election of 1800 ramping up, those who supported Republican candidate Thomas Jefferson viewed the stationing of federal troops near Virginia's capital as an attempt at political intimidation. I mean, it's a, it's a decent interpretation. Yeah. I don't know what else it would be. Yeah. The quasi-war with France in 1798 to 1800 also showed the enslaved in the area that all this political unrest made for an ideal time to strike. Heck yeah. By the time that Gabriel was 24 years old in 1800, he had devised a detailed plan to stage a revolt that would go on to be known as Gabriel's Rebellion. As the presidential election descended into violence, He had high hopes that the poor white people would join them under the banner of death or liberty in a march on Virginia's capital of Richmond. One conspirator would later state that he, quote, was to go to the nation of Indians called Catawbas to persuade them to join the Negroes to fight the white people, end quote. He spent the first half of 1800 gathering a group of conspirators that quickly spread the word among the slave quarters in around two dozen counties across Virginia and North Carolina including towns such as Richmond, Petersburg, Norfolk, Albemarle? Sure. Sure. Gabriel became the natural leader due to a number of factors. Not only was he literate and highly intelligent, but he was also a blacksmith. In West African culture, blacksmiths were feared and respected for their ability to forge weapons. Mm -hmm. It was believed that blacksmiths held the secrets to the mysteries of metal and the spiritual properties it possessed due to its connection to Ogun, the god of iron, warfare, and metalwork. Many of the enslaved on the Virginia plantation still upheld the beliefs of West Africa, and those trained in the art of smithing were granted the highest degree of respect. That's awesome. I thought that was super cool. Like, I didn't know that. Yeah. Learn something new. A group of enslaved men on plantations near Brook, just north of Richmond, got to talking. Led by Sam Bird Jr., was a slave of widow Jane Clark, and it's believed that he was the driving force behind the rebellion, as far as, like, getting the conversations going. Mm -hmm. Sam connected with other like-minded slaves, such as George Smith, who was a slave of widow Ann Smith, an enslaved man named Gilbert, who was owned by William Young, and a hired slave who also worked on the young plantation named Ben Wolfock. Joining this group was a large, powerful man named Jack Bowler, or Jack Ditcher, who had been contracted out in the area by his widow master in Caroline County, and, of course, Gabriel himself. Each of these men utilized their connections with friends and family to start gathering other rebel conspirators. The toughest challenge that they faced was simply recruiting others to join their cause. Sam stated that he had been able to round up 500 men. Another claimed that their numbers had swelled to 5,000. 
while another claimed that Gabriel had shared that their forces were 10,000 strong. I kind of doubt that with just people yeah. being afraid of yeah. the current power. It wasn't just enslaved African Americans that joined up. There were also free African Americans, some white workers who were sympathetic to their cause, and two Frenchmen and military abolitionists named Charles Quercy and Alexander Bedenhurst. Nice. The two French guys. <laughs> <laughs> oui, oui, ha, ha. It's okay. They're cool. They're cool. Rebels gathered under bridges, near springs, at religious gatherings, and even after a funeral to hash out their plan. Dang. The hardest part of the whole plot was recruitment, merely ensuring they had enough forces to make the rebellion a success. Mm -hmm. By August, the details had been hashed out, and it was agreed that the attack on Richmond would take place at night. Upon Gabriel's signal in Hanover County, the rebels would gather under the cover of darkness and kill both Thomas Jr. and Absalom before heading towards the state capital. Along the way, they would be joined by thousands of other freedom fighters in Caroline County that had risen up against their masters to make the six-mile march to the capital. Six miles, wow. So after you after you murder several people, you're like, and now we walk six miles. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. It's a long night. Yeah. Three separate groups would converge on the capital from Norfolk, Henrico County, and Petersburg before stealing muskets that were stored in the state armory. Mm. A group of 50 men would enter the lower section of the town and set fire to the bulk of the wooden structures to draw out the residents of the city. At the same time, the main group of men would attack the whites living in Brook before swarming on Upper Richmond, overtaking the handful of guards that watched over the state armory and penitentiary. This group of men would then capture Governor Monroe, or possibly kill him. The, the, <laughs> goal, the goal was to, like, hold him for ransom. Yeah, and negotiate. <laughs> but if he's annoying, we'll just murder him. <laughs> yeah, we'll just kill him. It's fine. <laughs> Once the rebels gained hold of the munition stash, they would converge and dispose of the firefighters in the lower section of the city. Dang. Rebels were told differing stories about who was fighting their cause. Some were told that poor whites were going to join the rebellion. Others heard rumors an invading French army from the South Quay on Virginia's Blackwater River would aid their cause. Mm -hmm. Recruits were told that it was going to be black-on-white violence with no discrimination. <laughs> Others, that the only white people to spare were Methodists, French nationals, Quakers that supported abolition, and other groups who were active in the movement. Heck yeah, the Methodists were okay. <laughs> yeah, we're all good. The Methodists are cool. <laughs> we're just that's, like, whatever. That's so weirdly specific. I know, right? I love the, like, the Quakers that were sympathetic. Like, we all hate Quakers, but these guys are cool. <laughs> yeah. Regardless of who was being recruited, the one thing that remained the same was that enslaved women were not allowed to be included. Are you kidding? Mm -mm. It was a men-only thing. Was it because it was too dangerous? Maybe. I don't Maybe know. Too exertive? Like, they didn't think women could kill? Even though, like, <laughs> excuse me, there's, like, an entire TV show dedicated to women who murder. <laughs> Maybe because... If they got caught, they didn't want the women to have to suffer the same fate that they would. Potentially. It could be a protection thing. Yeah, I don't know. And maybe it was harder to recruit women to do it. Yeah. Or they were afraid that women would just, like, expose them right away. I don't know. I don't know what their reasoning hmm. was. I just... <laughs> no ladies allowed. In early August, Gabriel and two other men were able to slip into the capital unnoticed to survey the weapons stash there. Robert Cowley, who worked as the keeper of the capital and doorman to the Council of State, had slipped the keys to Gabriel. As a former slave of the Randolph family who had gained his freedom, he supported their cause, and a later investigation would exonerate Randolph for any involvement in the rebellion. Hmm. Gabriel, Bowler, and another rebel had managed to gather gunpowder, and Gabriel and his brother Martin made musket balls. They also mm. planned to seize a cache of militia muskets that was being stored at a local tavern along the way. 
for those who didn't plan to attack the armory. Gabriel, along with his brother Solomon and another enslaved man named Thornton, who worked at a forge at the Hanover Courthouse, took scythe blades and refashioned them into swords. Oh, no. Oh, that's terrifying. They made around 12 dozen of them. Oh, my God, that's horrifying. I would not want to be on the receiving end of that. No. Nope. Jack Bowler stated that he made 50 pikes, or spears, by attaching bayonets to the ends of the poles. Oh, my God. As of Saturday, August 30th, Gabriel felt ready to stage the rebellion. He anticipated 600 rebels, while Solomon expected 1,000, and those in his inner circle had secured a sufficient number of munitions. Only 150 rebels actually gathered to make the six-mile or nine-and-a-half-kilometer trek to storm the capital, as by sundown, because they were going to go at night, a massive storm made any sort of attack impossible washing out bridges and flooding roads. That's so awful. Like, you spend all this time and you're like, yeah, we're going to do this. And then they think it was God saying no or something, you know. Yeah. According to James Callender, who was in jail at the time for violating the Sedition Act, because he (laughs) was like, the government sucks. Government sucks. And they're like, go to jail. (laughs) (laughs) Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Straight to jail. Straight to jail. He described it as, quote, the most terrible thunderstorm that I ever witnessed in this state, end quote. A handful of the men had met at the designated spot to follow through with their plan. But when it became plain that the rain was going to prevent it from happening, They dispersed, and word was sent out that they would try again the following day, so Sunday, August 31st. Oh, no. The rebellion ended up being sabotaged from within the next day by two slaves named Pharaoh and Tom. Owned by the Shepherd family, they headed to Richmond to alert Mosby Shepherd at Meadow Farm about the plot. Hmm. Mosby sent word to Governor James Monroe in Richmond, as well as the local militia. With the plan exposed, those in power in Virginia turned the full force of their power against the rebels. The governor assembled the state militia and ordered them to protect the capital and its armory, effectively killing Gabriel's rebellion before it even had a chance to get off the ground. By the evening, patrols had started rounding up suspects. Mosby's warning generated patrols in Richmond, and he also sent word to Petersburg, where they had already heard rumors of the revolt back at the beginning of August. Mm-hmm. Men living in Brook, suspected of taking part in the plot, were rounded up and placed in either the public jail or the penitentiary. Over the next few weeks, over 30 of Gabriel's supporters were arrested and jailed, and on September 11th, they were presented before the Henrico court and stood accused of conspiracy and insurrection. Mm-hmm. Two Henrico justices acted as Oyer and Terminer, meaning they would decide the convicted's fate instead of a trial by jury. I don't know if that's better or worse, honestly. Yeah. So they can still hear testimony, mm-hmm. but they are the ones that decide. it. Yeah. Yeah. There isn't any jury at all. Mm-hmm. Jack Bowler and Gabriel were still on the run, and wanted posters were circulated. Gabriel made for an imposing figure, standing at over six feet tall. He had two missing teeth, a, quote, bony face, well made, end quote, and, quote, two or three scars on his head, end quote. I forgot that, like, being over six feet tall was super tall back in the day. Yeah. Like, I remember everybody freaking out about George Washington, that he was six feet tall. Yeah. Well, and I would imagine it's the same thing with, like, Swift Runner. If you're a person of color and you're, like, mm-hmm. over six feet tall, people are like, yeah. oh, my God. Like, like, they just lose their minds. Right. Whereas today, most people are tall and it's not even that big of a deal. Right. We're like, oh, hey. Now, if you were seven feet tall, I'd be like, oh, shit. (laughs) That actually just reminds me of poor, your poor husband when he went to (laughs) Remsen that one time. (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) Apparently, he was too tall for that town. He's too um, tall. Too tall for rural Iowa. It would have been funnier if they would have just like thrown a basketball at him or something. (laughs) And he caught it. (laughs) 
<laughs> I knew it. <laughs> Kobe. That's the check. That's the test. If you're tall, you just get basketballs thrown at you. Yep. Gabriel resurfaced on September 14th, 1800, when he swam in the James River out to a schooner known as Mary, asking Captain Richardson Taylor for safe passage to Norfolk. The captain attempted to do so until two of the enslaved sailors on his ship, Isham and Will Billy King, alerted port authorities of his whereabouts in an effort to earn the $300 or $7,000 today reward for information leading to Gabriel's capture. I mean, if you're a slave... That's enough to buy your freedom. Yeah. I, I mean, I get it. It's really, it sucks, but mm-hmm. I get it. News reached the Port Authority on September 23rd in Norfolk, and Gabriel was arrested on September 27th. He was incarcerated at Virginia State Penitentiary and put on trial on October 6th, 1800. He refused to make any statements in his defense. Yeah. Because he was going to do it. Yeah. I don't think he said anything at trial. He just stood there. Probably not. Like, yeah, I was going to do it. So do what you're going to do. Yeah. Billy, who was ultimately the one who spoke to authorities, was only given $50, or around $1,200 today, for turning over Gabriel's whereabouts. And it wasn't nearly enough to buy him his freedom. Great. So it wasn't even worth it. I mean, money is money, but yeah, but if you, not what if he you thought it was going to be. Yeah, and turning on somebody like that. That yeah, Jack Bowler ended up turning himself in on October 9th, Was tried and convicted on October twenty ninth, and later transported out of the state. So what that means is basically he was sold to another master outside of Virginia. Yeah, that makes sense to try to separate them. Mm -hmm. The rebellion attempt ended in the arrest and prosecution of over 70 enslaved men and the hanging of 26 rebels. Mm. Eight others were transported to other states. 13 were declared guilty but later pardoned by the governor. And 25 more were acquitted by their local judges or magistrates. Mm. One suspected rebel completed suicide by hanging before his trial. Additionally, a small number of free blacks were also suspected of taking part and put on trial, as well as the two Frenchmen. Oh, no. (laughs) Poor guys. (laughs) Of those who were hanged, as public executions were still very much a popular affair, Mm -hmm. 15 were hanged at, quote unquote, the usual place in Richmond, (laughs) which today would be on the intersection of 15th and Broad Streets. Okay. You know, the usual spot. The usual spot. The hanging spot. Yeah. Five were hanged on September 12th, five on September 15th, and five on September 18th. Hmm. On October 10th, three others, including Gabriel, were hanged at that spot, although the seven remaining were taken to two other gallows outside of Richmond to serve as warnings for the large slave populations that lived outside the city limits. Gross. And we know for sure that two of the men were Gabriel's own brothers, Solomon and Martin. Before his death, Solomon said of his brother, quote, My brother Gabriel was the person who influenced me to join him and others in order that, as he said, we might conquer the white people and possess ourselves of their property, end quote. During the trials that took place, it was difficult for the court to prove that the defendants had committed any acts in the conspiracy, the chief of which being proving that they had actually joined the plot in the first place. Yeah. Witnesses testified about how they were recruited and specifically on what language was used to recruit them. Many were falsely told that a large number of men had already been recruited as a small group storming the Capitol would be akin to suicide. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you would have to say that it was a lot of people. I kind of figured that's what was happening when they're like, oh, yeah, 6,000 mm-hmm. men, 10,000 men. Yeah. More than two dozen enslaved men and one enslaved woman testified at the trials, with three men providing the bulk of the testimony. They included Ben, who was a slave that belonged to Thomas Jr. and who had worked alongside Gabriel. Ew. 
John, who was enslaved by Sally Price and had been hired out in Richmond, and Ben Wolfuck, who was enslaved by Paul Graham of Caroline and Hanover, but he had been hired out to William Young at the time of the plot. Of the three who testified heavily during the trial, Ben Wolfuck was found guilty of his involvement in the plot. In an effort to gain a pardon, he confessed to his involvement and surrendered the names of several co-conspirators. The other Ben, who was owned by Thomas Jr., later earned his freedom after a group of private subscribers raised the funds to purchase him from Thomas Jr. Mm, I'm conflicted about that. Yeah. Like, good for him, but also screw him. Yeah. But also, would he have had a choice anyway? Yeah. They brought him in. So, yeah. I suppose, honestly, good for him. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like... Did they even have a choice to participate in any of that? Well, and you do what you need to do to survive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Especially yeah. if you know that the alternative is being hanged. Well, and the alternative is being hanged or... Or, like, beaten to death when you get back to the plantation. As soon as you get home, yeah. Beaten to death by your co-workers or beaten to death by your owner. Yeah. Like... It was the yeah. lesser of two evils, so You're it's kind not... Of put in a, an impossible situation. Yeah. Pharaoh and Tom, who revealed the plot and stopped it from happening were granted freedom from their bonds by the General Assembly. Two other African Americans, one who was enslaved and another that was free, were given rewards for their efforts in helping secure the capture of Gabriel and Jack Bowler. Even the captain, who attempted to aid Gabriel in his flight to freedom, was put on trial before the mayor of Richmond. But with no white men able to testify against him, since his crew was made up entirely of enslaved men, Mm -hmm. he was released. Nice. Because we can't trust them. The word of enslaved people is not admissible in court. Great. Yeah. Thomas Jr. attempted to sue the captain for harboring Gabriel, (laughs) but later dropped the suit, likely due to lack of evidence. Yep. Like, if he wasn't found guilty before, how how is he going to be found guilty the second time? He's not. Screw you. Yeah. (laughs) Junior. Juniors are awful. (laughs) Gabriel was the last of the enslaved to be hanged alone near Richmond's slave jail on October 10th, 1800, at the age of 24. A marker at the place where the execution took place reads as follows, quote, near here is the early site of the Richmond gallows and burial ground for Negroes. On October 10th, 1800, Gabriel, an enslaved blacksmith from Brookfield Plantation in Henrico County, was executed there for attempting to lead a mass uprising against slavery on August 30th, 1800. A fierce rainstorm delayed the insurrection, which then was betrayed by two slaves. Gabriel escaped and eluded capture until September 23rd, when he was arrested in Norfolk. He was returned to Richmond on September 27th, and incarcerated in the Virginia State Penitentiary. On October 6th, he stood trial and was condemned. At least 25 of his supporters were also put to death there or in other jurisdictions, end quote. That's all on a plaque? It's like on a big side, like road marker on the side of the highway. Dang. Mm-hmm. It's a big old sign marker. <laughs> it's, it's big. It's a lot of detail. Yeah. Like, great, but I was surprised because I was just thinking, like, here lies here lies this man. Yep. <laughs> here be the old gallows at the usual place. <laughs> you know, yeah. After the first 10 men had been executed, Governor Monroe sent a letter to President Thomas Jefferson on September 15th to see how many executions were necessary to prevent another insurrection from occurring. Great. Jefferson's a jerk so i'm sure he was like a million (laughs) by the time a response was delivered on september 20th five more men had already been hanged jefferson's response was that he felt 15 was enough and worried that if virginia executed more than was quote-unquote absolutely necessary or i'm sorry absolute necessity that the rest of the country would condemn them for an act of revenge versus justice Okay, fine. I guess he was reasonable, but he was still a jerk and I don't like yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. Governor Monroe presented this request before the city council, 
but they refuse to budge. Uh, yeah, they were like, we don't care if it looks like revenge, it is revenge. Yeah. However, they changed their tune as the expense of reimbursing slave owners for the loss of their slaves grew to a number that exceeded what they were willing to spend. Mm-hmm. It totaled $8,900, or $210,000 today. Whoa. Yeah, no city has that money yeah. at the time. Yeah. Following this, pardons and transportation were set forth, saving the Commonwealth about 45% of what they would have paid had they executed all the guilty slaves as planned. Yeah. So I guess that was the one bright side of being considered property. Yep. Either being pardoned or sold off to somebody else in a different state. Great. The only partial pro, I guess. Regiments of the local militia were mobilized in Chesterfield and Henrico counties to prevent future uprisings. They stayed in place until mid-October and were also sent out to secure the arsenal at Point of Fork in Fluvanna County. Militias also took up residence in Nansemond and Suffolk in order to escort rebels in Caroline County. As you can imagine, this type of placement was costly. Yeah. The insurrection attempt brought about changes regarding state slave laws at the next meeting of the General Assembly. Some of these changes included the adoption of transportation as an alternative to capital punishment, which meant that accused slaves would be sent over state lines and sold to other masters. Mm-hmm. Other changes included the banning of freeing slaves. And if free, the free people were required to leave the state within six months or risk re-enslavement. Awesome. Yep. That's horrific. Yep. Other changes included the allowance of slave testimony against free African Americans in court. Local magistrates were given authority to send out patrols. The hiring out of slaves had to be regulated. And lists of free people of color and where they lived had to be compiled and reported annually. Ew. Yep. Like an offender list. Yep. Great. An attempt was also made by the legislature to prevent enslaved people from piloting boats as it allowed them too much freedom. But that didn't pass. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) We don't need them on boats. (laughs) As a result of the plot, the state arsenal was moved from Point of Fork to Richmond, and a new public guard was set up in the capital. On October 2nd, 1800, Nathaniel Turner was born in Southampton County, Virginia. 31 years later, he would lead a rebellion that would become a legend amongst enslaved Americans and abolitionists alike exposing the full extent of slave owner savagery to the world. As of December 1st, 1800, 72 men linked to the insurrection had been tried, 58 in Henrico County, 3 in Richmond City, 9 in Caroline County, and 1 each in Louisa and Dinwiddie counties. Two years after Gabriel's execution, a former member of Gabriel's rebellion named Sancho attempted another rebellion in 1802 along the Appomattox, and Roanoke Rivers. Okay. Between 1801 and 1805, the Virginia Assembly met to discuss the merits of slowly emancipating the enslaved African Americans in their state. But ultimately, they decided that instead of doing that, they would just outlaw teaching them how to read and limit how often they could be hired out. Great. Gabriel's Rebellion is the largest slave insurrection attempted in the southern United States. Had the plot not been released, it's very likely that it would have succeeded. In the words of one of the accused who was put to death, quote, I have nothing more to offer than what General Washington would have had to offer, had he been taken by the British and put to trial by them. I have adventured my life in endeavoring to obtain the liberty of my countrymen, and am a willing sacrifice in their cause, end quote. Oh. Lastly, in 2007, Virginia Governor Tim Kaine gave Gabriel and his co-conspirators an informal pardon in recognition of their cause, quote, the end of slavery and the furtherance of equality for all people has prevailed in the light of history, end quote. Right. And that's the story of Gabriel Prosser and Gabriel's Rebellion. 
Yeah, what would have life like, looked like if they would have succeeded? I know. Yeah. Gabriel was really cool. Even missing two teeth. Yeah. Cool dude. And it's just... So I had never heard this before, before no. I started researching this. And the thing that made me so angry is that it was stopped by a thunderstorm. Yes. Like, it wasn't anything else. Like, pe- nobody had, like, exposed it. Nobody had done this, that, or the other. Like, and the only reason the Pharaoh and Tom had exposed it was because, since it was delayed because of the mm-hmm. weather, they were worried they, they were going to get fanned out. They, they panicked, and they didn't want their masters to get slaughtered. Yeah. Because there was that conflicting thing, like, we're going to kill all the whites, or we're only going to save certain whites, like Methodists Mm -hmm. and Quakers that are cool with abolition. You know, like, it was... Yeah, it was up and there were too many conflicting theories. Yeah, it was just too many variables. But, yeah, just the fact that a thunderstorm was what threw the whole thing off. That's so awful. That's so awful. Yeah. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. On TikTok, of course you are. Follow us at Yield Crime Podcast. Hey, creepy people! This is PNW Haunts and Homicides. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Cassie. Together, we explore stories of the paranormal and true crime throughout the Pacific Northwest. For each episode, we do a tarot reading to help us gain some insight on the topic as we share the facts of the case and our interpretations. You can find our episodes featuring true stories from infamous cases such as the misdeeds of Boeing, as well as lesser known true crime cases like the murders in Tunnel 13 as well as our spooky stories from Pike Place and Raven's Manor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you'd like to listen. Have Have a a creepy-ass day! And this week's podcast plug is the PNW Haunts and Homicides podcast. Join our friends Caitlin and Cassie as they chat about true crime, the paranormal, and all kinds of spooky shit in the Pacific Northwest. Nice. They were on a recent episode of Can You Crack the Cramp Word? So if you would like to learn a little bit more about them... Check out that episode, and we will have a link to their show in the show notes. Nice. So what is something good you'd like to share? We just signed a lease on a new apartment. Wee! We surprised my fiancé's daughter by checking it out and letting her see what her new room looks like. So Aww. we had a nice little weekend of like figuring out what she wants her room to be decorated like. And we will get to move in a couple of weeks. So kind of getting that going. But it was really a very cathartic, (laughs) nice thing to sign a new lease for a new place. Especially since this place, while it started out really great, has ended pretty terribly. Mm -hmm. Including not having a functioning stove and an unattended gas leak for a week. Did they fix that finally? On Friday. Yeah, a literal week from when I reported it. And I had to continually report it and like go into the office and hunt everybody down to be like, hey, when's somebody coming into my apartment to fix my stove? Because I need to have a functioning stove to cook things. You know, not have a gas leak in my house. So, yeah, I just want to be done with this place. I hear that. We're moving into a brand new townhome that was built last March. Nobody has ever lived in it. So hopefully we will be a lot healthier and happier Mm -hmm. (laughs) in two weeks. So You will be the first person to fart in that place. Oh my God, I can't wait. Well, what's one good thing for you? Can it start out bad and then be good? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's like my life right now. So... So, (laughs) I'm still a little upset about this. So on Friday, so this was very recently on Friday, I fed Charlie and I've gone back to feeding him just adult mice because I I don't like the inconsistencies of rats, like the the young rats, because they can be a little too big and it just makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. And I noticed after he ate one that he had this big lump 
on the side of his neck. No. And I was like, I don't recall that being there earlier today. Because I had seen him earlier in the day. Yeah. And it wasn't there on Thursday. So I called the vet that I take him to. There's a specialty vet. Yep. Like a half hour away from here that I take him to. Explained what was happening and said, can I get him in today? Because I, I want to get him looked at. Like, this isn't. Yeah. And so I brought him in and they were like, well, we'd like to do an x-ray to make sure there's nothing internal going on. Because mm-hmm. they're like, it, it's, it could be something where maybe he was bit and then like an air bubble formed. Oh. Because they would have no, he would have no way of like expelling that because of the scales. Yeah. So they're like, we just kind of wanted to see where we can find out. Yeah. So we got the, so we got the x-ray. X-ray for a snake. <laughs> and that was like 150 bucks. I have, that's actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And they were like, it looks like it could be an infection. Do you mind if we take a sample of some of the tissue to do, to like look at it under a microscope? And I was yeah. like, okay. And that's another significant amount of money. Yeah. yeah. And then ultimately they're like, it looks like he has a bacterial infection. But we don't oh, no. know, like, what exactly. And so as I was talking to them about it, I was expressing my concerns about, like, feedings and stuff. And they're like, we think you should not do live feedings anymore. Yep. Just to keep him safe. And I was like, I'm totally cool with that. Like, yep. So there's some other different feeding methods that I'm not going to get into right now. Mm-hmm. So I have antibiotics for him. Oh, no. How do you do that? You have to give him a shot. So I have to give him a shot every three days. Oh, my God. And I'm going to make Thomas help me because it's... How do you it, not, yeah, how do you not get bit? <laughs> well, so, like, she showed me where to do it. And I had to completely clean out his enclosure. I had to wipe everything down with this, like, special cleaner. Yeah, because it was a bacterial spray. Yeah, so right now he's living on top of, like, paper towels. Oh, sorry, Charlie. And I feel so bad. It's the saddest looking enclosure right now ever. Like, it just looks, like, super sad. It it looks like he's patient zero. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. But I ordered him a new hide that they recommended based off some of the behaviors that I told them about. I got different substrate because they said that the substrate I had, because it's dustier, it could have been what led to the infection. Oh, okay. it, it could be like a respiratory thing. So I have different substrate for him. And they said to wait to feed him until after he's gone through all of his antibiotics. And I was like, that is Aww. totally fine. So I'm going to wait a month, which he'll be fine. Yeah. I forget that like they're good with that. That's Yeah. And my biggest concern was, and I was talking to the vet and I was like, please tell me he's not fat. Because... <laughs> snakes can become obese and i was really worried that i was feeding him too much Mm -hmm. and he's like no he's like he's a healthy weight he looks totally fine he's like ball pythons are naturally a little bit heavier like they feel heavy and he's like unless he was completely round i would i'm not concerned he's like he looks perfect for being one and a half years old like he's awesome he looks fine. And I was like, okay, good. You don't need to fat shame Charlie. I don't need to fat shame him. So $400 later. Yeah. Charlie is doing better. Is it painful that I spent that much money on a snake? Yes. Yes. But. It is extremely painful. But he's my little boy. And I want him to be happy and healthy. And be able to live with me for the next 20 to 30 years. So. Yeah. It is what it is, but I'm glad that he's home. He seems to be better. He was so pissed by the end of being like poked and prodded and picked up and stuff. Like he was just, he was over it. When Smooch was sick recently, the the vet had to stick his finger in her butt to pull the poop out. So like she didn't look at me in the eye for like three days. And the, the screams. (laughs) <laughs> that I heard <laughs> come from the back room where they were doing it. I was oh like, I God. never want to do this again. I never, ever, ever want to oh do this God. again. Yeah, I, I think I would scream too. If somebody would stick a finger, yeah, and pull poop out of my butt. 
I did get a sense of satisfaction when they told me that he was one of the most well-behaved snakes that they have seen. <laughs> they That's were right. like, he's he's extremely chill. He, <laughs> No one had any issues handling him. He took the shot like a champ. That's like awesome. It wasn't until the very end when they were trying to weigh him, because they had to put him in like this big, like, <laughs> you know, thing. like Tupperware container on top of like a... <laughs> A little like kitchen scale to like weigh him you know <laughs> yeah. and i was trying to set him in there and like towards the end he like opened his mouth and was like <sighs> and, he, and i was like, like leave me alone i understand you're done you want to go home yeah. we're good yeah. but so that's my charlie adventures i'm glad my little boy's feeling better so shall we shut her down let's do it all right a great way to support the show, if you can't do so financially, is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. This week's review comes from Podchaser, our good friend Sarai from the Freaky AF Podcast. Hey, Sarai. She says, one of my favorite podcasts. Love Lindsay's storytelling and Maddie's commentary, and the topics they cover are so unique. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarai. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. <laughs> and I hit puberty. <laughs> and I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime. Weird Distractions is a weekly true crime, paranormal, conspiracy theory podcast hosted by me, Alex. Each week, I tell you what I need a distraction from before diving into a topic to help me distract myself from whatever is going on. My hope is that you too can get a distraction from tuning in and maybe learn something on the way. From haunted hospitals to cold cases and every bizarre online theory in between, there's a little something for every weirdo out there. If this sounds up your alley, then join me every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on your favorite podcast platform or search Weird Distractions Podcast on any social media account. Need a distraction? I got you. You. and i hear them call me by by my name so i run into the kitchen to check and there's nobody there and i start to like hear like my closet door start to open oh hell no like, oh, my God. Inside. oh hell no all of a sudden for no reason i woke up in the middle of the night like my eyes just snapped open and it's that strange feeling that you have when something wakes you up you and you don't know what has woken you up until you either see what it was or you hear whatever it was. If you like all things spooky, check out As Spooky Tales. We, Christina, and MJ talk about all things spooky like haunted places, myths, and legends. With a focus on Latin America. New episodes every Friday. Listen in your favorite podcast apps as well as spookytales.com.